Hi, everyone. We're very excited to be here today with you. I'm Teddy Krolik with M.MTA's Office of Planning, and part of my job is to help our office connect with the people who are closest to our service, whether they're customers, operators, community members, so that their insights and experiences can help the agency make better decisions. Today, I'm joined by Alvaro Cifuentes, representing our technical team. I'll start off the meeting with some backgrounds on the project, and Alvaro will introduce the technical analysis he and his team have done. This is a recording of the public presentation that we offered at our June 23rd and June 29th public meetings. We weren't able to record those meetings as they were going on, so we're doing this a little bit later just to be able to preserve, again, the presentation that we did offer to be able to go over the slides, the maps, the discussion points that we did have with members of the public this summer. You can review those at your leisure. We're also going to be providing a extensive summary and report of everything that we've learned during this outreach phase later this fall, and we look forward to sharing that with you. So with that, we're gonna get going. And uh, here again, we're just showing you the exact slides that we shared at our June 23rd and 29th meetings, which include some instructions about how to use the Zoom platform. So before diving in, we would like to give you a sense of what we're doing here. Uh, we're still in the beginning phase of a long-term effort to plan, design, and construct major transit infrastructure that goes through a comprehensive federal approval process, including a record of decision following the National Environmental Policy Act review process. That's the NEPA process. As you can see right now, we're in the feasibility study, which means we know the general areas we're trying to connect with new transit service, but we don't yet know exactly where or how to do it. So we're still in the process of reducing what is a huge number of options into a smaller and smaller subset of options also known as alternatives, so that we can eventually settle on a single choice, also known as a locally preferred alternative, so that eventually we can secure federal funding and approval. And in this meeting, we're going to learn more about your preferences regarding key trade-offs to narrow the alternatives down from seven to a smaller number that will receive additional environmental and an engineering analysis in the coming years. So let's move on to the next slide. To repeat, we really don't know the details yet of exactly what is the best route, what's the best mode, or even where to start and end the transit service. So your feedback helps MTA and its regional partners in Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Howard County determine which of these options or even combination of options should move forward to the next phase of study. In that next phase, we'll have more details about things like traffic modeling and how dedicated guideways would impact the transportation network. So on this next slide, you can see an example of how we tried to warm up the crowd. We don't have to worry about doing that on this recording. So let's move on to the next slide. And as I mentioned before, I'm going to provide a brief overview of the project before handing it off to Alvaro. Um, we're then going to get into some more details about the actual alternatives themselves and share with you the initial analysis that we've done so far. So we can move on. Here you can see that we are yet again talking about another plan. We are, of course, from the planning office. We, we do love plans. But the regional transit plan is actually a little bit different than the typical kind of plan that we work on because it, can, it covers such a large geographic area and it's taking place over an extremely long period of time, looking at all the way to 2045. It's also a little different in that it requires all of the counties in the central Maryland region. So that's Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Howard County, Anne Arundel County, Hartford County. All of the counties need to actually work with each other. Uh, yes, that's something new. It's something uh, exciting and it is happening. Um, so I think that's something that's very positive about this project, and I hope that it will make, again, good developments going forward. So let's move on to the next slide where we can get into the regional transit corridor system. So here you can see the 30 corridors that were identified by MTA and the Regional Transit Plan Commission that together would create a strong transit network in central Maryland. So these corridors are places that show a strong demand for transit. They connect people across multiple jurisdictions in the region, and they're not just lines on a map showing where current service goes. These are actually opportunities to explore new ways to make it easier to travel without a car, including new transportation modes, new schedules, new routes, and new infrastructure. So here you can see all 30 at once, but the RTP Commission also identified a subset 
of what we're calling early opportunity corridors. That means that they're the first ones that we're going to study, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's get to the next slide. M.MTA, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Howard County, right now are looking at the first two early opportunity transit corridors. These were selected based on data showing transit readiness and potential to contribute to equitable transportation outcomes, including access to jobs and other essential trips. Here you can see what I call the green wine bottle of the east-west area and the blue footprint blob for the north-south study. In the north-south, we're looking at connections between Towson and downtown Baltimore. In the east-west corridor, we're looking at connections between Bayview and Ellicott City. So today we're gonna to focus on the east-west corridor. We're planning to be back out later this fall to talk about the north-south, so stay tuned for that. Let's move on to the next slide. So again, let's be clear, we do need better east-west transit connections, not only far into the future, but also today and tomorrow. So the regional transit corridor study process, which covers the entire area here shown in green, it's a long-term effort. But we need to also be working on several other projects at the same time that will improve service in the immediate and near term. So first, for all of you quick bus fans, M.MTA just announced a proposal as part of our annual service changes for a new limited stop service pilot route, that's the Quick Link 40, that would go into effect as soon as August 28th of this year. Second, the Raise Baltimore Transit Priority Project is bringing $50 million worth of transit infrastructure investment to the city with blue and orange lines, including dedicated bus lanes, improved bus shelters, crosswalks, ADA access, all of that coming in the next couple of years. So let's move on to the next slide. As you can see, we've been working on this for a while uh, before doing any of the modeling or detailed analysis that we're going to share today. We spent a lot of time in the last year talking with folks about their big picture goals and objectives for what the corridors could be, including the places they could connect and the larger priorities that they could support. So in all of these engagement activities, we put a real emphasis on making sure that we're talking with a representative group of riders and residents. We've done this by sending out 14,000 randomly addressed survey postcards to area residents. We've done it by sending street teams to ride buses, in addition to hosting public meetings like this one, posting online materials, and of course, making presentations at community association meetings. Let's go on to the next slide. So here you can see some of the goals. These are the specific East-West corridor goals that we've developed as a result of our meetings, of our presentations, of our analysis. And you can see here that we've, again, spelled out specific goals that we would like to eventually operationalize and then measure. So that's something that we're going to be getting into in the rest of this presentation. But the goals for this east-west corridor are to improve the connectivity and operations of the existing transit network. Second, to expand the reach and connectivity of the regional transit network. So again, the difference between one and two is one is looking at existing, two is looking at expanding and making new connections. Number three is prioritize the needs of existing transit riders and transit critical populations. Fourth, maximize the economic and environmental benefit of a major transit investment. So let's go on to the next slide where we've got a poll that we again asked folks to tell us which of these goals were most important, which two really made a difference. When we did present these back at our meetings in June, the top three goals in order were definitely number one, two, and three. Um, but they were generally roughly split between them. So let's move on to the next slide. I'm going to turn it over to Albro here to talk about, again, how we try to operationalize and tangibly measure how each of these alternatives meets the individual corridor goals. This is going to be the heart of our conversation today. I'll return later when we've got a little bit more discussion to cover. So Albro, on to you. Thanks, Teddy. Based on the market analysis conducted and the project goals that uh, you just mentioned, MTA, in partnership with the local jurisdictions, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Howard County, developed seven alternatives that we're currently testing. Uh, these alternatives were developed to test different modes, including bus rapid transit, light rail transit, and heavy rail transit, different guideway treatments, including transit streets specifically dedicated uh, for transit use, dedicated guideways, and tunnels. In addition, we looked at different area trade-offs. 
at the west end of the study area? Should we be terminating at the CMS SSA? Or should we be extending the alignment to head into Howard County and Ellicott City? At the east end of the study area, should we be terminating at Bayview or extending the alignment into Essex? Should the alternative serve the Inner Harbor Central Business District? Or should we bypass the CBD creating a more direct connection between West Baltimore and Bayview? Should the alternative serve Harbor East or be further north and serve Johns Hopkins Hospital? And finally, should the alternative be north or south of Patterson Park? We will be covering these geographic areas in greater detail later in this presentation. I will now be walking you through the seven alternatives under consideration. I'm gonna begin with alternatives one through three. These three alternatives, this, these first three alternatives share termini in common. They extend from Bayview to the east of the study area and terminate at Ellicott City in the west. Alternative one, shown in green on this map, is a bus rapid transit alternative. This alternative travels via Johns Hopkins Hospital and CMS SSA en route to Howard County. Similar to alternative one, alternative two in purple is a bus rapid transit alternative from Bayview to Ellicott City. This alternative, however, travels along US 40, traveling via Johns Hopkins Hospital, bypasses the CBD en route to Howard County. Alternative three is a hybrid alternative with heavy rail transit from Bayview to Edmondson Village and bus rapid transit from Edmondson Village to Ellicott City. Alternative four in light blue and alternative five in brown begin in Essex in the east and terminate at CMS SSA in the west. It travels, they travel between these endpoints via Bayview and Johns Hopkins Hospital. Alternative four and alternative five share very similar, similar alignments. However, alternative four is a light rail transit alternative and alternative five is a bus rapid transit alternative. Alternative six in yellow and seven in blue begin at Bayview in the east and end at CMS SSA in the west, traveling via the waterfront. These two alternatives share very similar alignment However, alternative six is a light rail transit alternative and alternative seven is a bus rapid transit alternative. This slide describes the three modes that we're currently considering. We have HRT or heavy rail, which is locally known as Metro Subway Link, which is an electrical rail system powered by a third rail. Uh, these vehicles must operate an exclusive fixed guideway, get guideway often underground. They serve areas with high density development and transit demand. And given the exclusive fixed guideways, many times requiring tunneling in dense urban areas. In addition, HRT has high construction costs. Light rail transit, or locally known as light rail link, is an electrical rail system powered by overhead wires. It mostly operates in dedicated fixed guideway however, can be adapted to run in mixed traffic. Light rail has high to medium construction costs. And finally, BRT is a bus-based transit system. Uh, BRT operates in both dedicated busways and mixed traffic along, allowing for route flexibility in high construction sections. BRT provides the quality of rail transit with the flexibility of buses that utilize transit signal priority, off-board fare collection, elevated platforms or level boarding and enhanced stations. These pictures represent the modes that we're considering. On the top left, you can see an example of a heavy rail transit system. Uh, pictured here is a Metro subway link station. On the bottom, you can see an example of a light rail transit system. Uh, pictured is the light rail link system and station at the convention center. And on the top right, you can see an example of a bus rapid transit system. Uh, the Baltimore region does not have a BRT system, but pictured is the BRT in Richmond. So in order to be able to compare alternatives amongst each others, 
a series of measures of effectiveness or MOEs were developed. The MOEs were developed based on the goals and objectives for the project. Uh, so under goal one, which is to improve the existing network, we have MOEs that include reliability, system travel savings, and travel time between two specific areas in the corridor. Under goal two, which is to expand the regional network, we have MOEs that include ridership, connections to existing transit, and access to households, students, and future jobs. Under goal three, which is to prioritize the needs of existing riders and transit critical populations, we have included access to several transit critical populations, including low income and minority populations, zero car households, students, seniors, et cetera. And finally, under goal four, which is to maximize the economic and environmental benefit, we have MOEs that include sustainability, cost, implementation, and tunneling risk. Towards the end of the presentation, we will be presenting the results of these MOEs for your review. So let me first discuss with you some of our overall takeaways based on the MOEs I just discussed. All of the alternatives under consideration attract more than enough ridership to support frequent transit service throughout the day. All alternatives improve travel times and reliability through extensive new dedicated guideways. Rail has better travel time performance than BRT due to an almost exclusive dedicated guideway and tunneling. All alternatives improve access to transit critical populations and access improvements are impacted by alignment, station spacing and travel time. And then finally, costs to build and operate rail alternatives are three to four times higher than BRT. Costs are mainly driven by mode and length of tunneling. So what we did during the live meetings is we broke into three different groups, West, Central, and East, to discuss these sections further and to get input from the public. We're gonna give you a flavor of what was presented and I'll pass it on to Teddy to talk about the West. Thanks, Alvaro. So here we're looking at the Eastern Baltimore County section. And the purpose of this slide is to show that of the seven alternatives, really only two, uh, you can see in kind of blue uh, an alternative four and then brown alternative five extends all the way to Essex. The, the rest of the alternatives are generally air, are generally ending in the Bayview area. So uh, we were then talking with people who attended the public meeting about the relative trade-offs of ending in Bayview or extending out to Essex. In the next slide, we look at the different alignments going above and below Patterson Park. So some continuing on Route 40. So for example, in let's say alternative two in purple, whereas others like yellow, uh, which is the light rail alternative are hugging the waterfront. And again, the relative merits of serving more jobs in the kind of Harbor area and Bells Point Canton versus serving some of the East Baltimore communities above Patterson Park that we know have many households that don't have access to private vehicles. So this is one of the discussions that we had. We then asked people about their impressions and let's move on to the center. Thanks, Teddy. Um, so in the center, we, we were looking at downtown. We had um, several alternatives that um, hug the waterfront. So they stay along the Pratt Lombard um, Baltimore streets, either above ground or underground. Um, so we were trying to get some feedback from, um, from the public as to uh, any preferences they had, um, pros and cons of tunneling through uh, the downtown area, and whether or not a transit street on Baltimore Street um, was something um, that attracted uh, them to that alternative. We also had a slide um, that asked a question about uh, tunneling and getting some input about uh, balancing uh, tunneling versus uh, running at the street level. We then looked at um, West Baltimore City. Uh, again, many alignments uh, that either utilize the highway to nowhere, uh, US 40, um, and then one alignment alternative five and brown that uh, deviates from the highway to nowhere and starts ser serving Baltimore Street. Um, and uh, for this one, we presented some differences between these, how 
um, serving neighborhoods along Baltimore Street provided increased ridership, uh, how some of the closer station spacing that we had with our uh, BRT alternatives, uh, providing more access for minority and low income populations, and then some um, complexities with uh, the rail modes having to get into downtown and potentially tunneling through this area. Uh, we had a, a question for, for the group. And now to talk about the west side, I'll pass it back to Teddy. Thanks, Alvaro. So again, here we're looking at some of the differences in modes. So for example, the heavy rail portion here is going to attract lots of ridership, um, but it also is going to have longer implementation time, higher costs. Uh, it's not going to connect to as many places once you pass through downtown. We also looked at the differences in station spacing between the alternatives where you can see that, for example, the bus rapid transit um, alternatives, you're going to be able to serve more minority and low income populations where, again, with heavy rail transit, you're going to space the stations a little bit farther apart, sometimes up to a mile. And that means that there will be, generally speaking, less access for folks who are in those areas. Um, let's move to the next slide. And then here in the far western portion, we're looking again, just like on the east side of the relative merits of extending all the way out to, let's say, uh, Ellicott City versus going out to CMS and SSA. Here you can see how get the alternatives are kind of split uh, between going north or south. Eventually, they generally end up on 40 as they're coming through West Baltimore. Uh, but we were trying to look at the differences in ridership and travel times uh, when we're going out to CMS and SSA versus going out to Ellicott City. Um, let's go back to the next question. And I should also say that for all these questions and actually for all of the comments, all of the questions that we've received, we are going to be producing a full report that explains what we heard from folks uh, what were the pieces that most influenced, again, our decision making, uh, along with our regional partners in deciding which of these alternatives and again, which kind of combinations of these alternatives we think deserve more study going forward. So there will be a summary of everything that we've heard and learned so far. So um, we look forward to sharing that with you. And again, in this far western portion of the corridor, we're looking specifically at Howard County and comparing some of the job access numbers, the daily boarding numbers, and again, noting that only a selection of alternatives are actually coming all the way out here. Um, so uh, this was our last breakout room question, and I guess um, we'll go on to the next slide from here. Thanks, Teddy. Um, so let's go back to the MOEs and the overall results uh, of these MOEs to see how these alternatives compare amongst each other. Uh, under goal one, which is to improve the connectivity and operations of the existing transit network. We had MOEs that focused on reliability, system travel time savings, and travel time. Um, alternative six, uh, which is the LRT alternative from Bayview to CMS, performs well in goal one, uh, mostly due to uh, long tunnel sections associated with this alternative, a long tunnel through downtown. Um, and longer station spacing. Um, both of these factors in increase reliability and reduce travel times for that specific alternative. Uh, like I mentioned, however, all alternatives across the board improve travel times and reliability for transit riders uh, through the use of extensive new dedicated guideways. So we're seeing uh, impacts to uh, travel times or benefits to the travel times for transit riders between West Baltimore and Bayview. Uh, differences in reliability between uh, rail and BRT is relatively small. And final, finally, the flexible, flexible guideway on BRT alternatives improves reliability over rail modes related to construction and incidents. It's a lot easier to detour a bus around a specific incident than it would be to um, do something with a light rail vehicle. Under goal two, uh, the MOEs under this goal focus on ridership, connections to existing transit service, and access to households and students, household students and jobs. Alternative six, LRT, and alternative seven, BRT, both from Bayview to CMS, perform well in goal two. These two alternatives serve dense areas with large concentrations of households and future jobs along that waterfront alignment. Alternative three, 
Uh, the MOEs under this goal focus on measuring access to several transit critical populations. Um, alternative two is the alternative that performs the best, but also alternative four, five, and seven perform very well providing access to transit critical populations. Within East Baltimore, alternatives four and five that stay north of Patterson Park provide access to significantly more transit critical populations compared to that waterfront alignment. However, these alternatives attract fewer boardings within this segment compared to alternatives that serve that waterfront and those jobs along the waterfront. Goal four, uh, the MOEs under this goal include sustainability, cost, implementation, and tunneling risk. The BRT alternatives one, two, six, and seven perform well under goal four. BRT modes have lower capital and operating costs compared to rail, and also greater cost effectiveness compared to uh, the rail alternatives that we're considering. And time to implement is directly related to costs and tunneling risks across the alternatives, favoring the BRT alternatives under consideration. I'm gonna pass it on to Teddy to talk about next steps. So we're really interested in talking with members of the public about which of these alternatives you think should continue on to the next phase where we're gonna do additional engineering and environmental analysis. As I said before, it's also possible that we could end up combining portions of different alternatives to make hybrid versions in the next rounds. So right now, of course, we're doing virtual events uh, but as we did with the survey, we're going to put a real emphasis, and we have been doing this, on going out to bus stops along the corridors, talking with people who ride the service. Uh, one of the best RTP events that we did back in 2019 was using the Owings Mills Metro Station to set up boards to talk to people during the afternoon rush hour. We've continued that, where we're going out to West Baltimore Mark, we're going out to Charles Center, we're going to, again, the major uh, bus stops and activity centers all along the corridor and talking to people as they're waiting for the bus, getting off the bus, bringing, again, many of the same materials that we're sharing today, just in kind of miniature form, and asking people which destinations are most important to connect, which of these alternatives would actually make a difference for them. Um, of course, if you've got other ideas about where we should be going, please do get in touch. You can see we've got the email, the phone number, uh, both of those go directly to our project team, and we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, we also have a lot of information on the website. Um, so if you do go to the rtpcorridors.com website, you'll see that we've got all the information that Alvaro went over, including a full table with all of the data that underlies the measures of effectiveness table that Alvaro, Alvaro was providing the summary for. Um, you can also provide comments on each of the alternatives. There's a built-in comment box where again, it pops up each uh, page that you go to. And I think that the website, again, has the most information. It's what we're using as a base when we go out to talk with folks at bus stops and other in-person events. So um, we're going to take all the information. As I said earlier, we're gonna be putting it into a report that will be coming out in just a little while, where again, we are gonna summarize what we've learned from this outreach over the summer. And I think that um, as we get into the next phase, we're going to justify and show why these alternatives, why these portions of the alternatives were the ones that we have selected again, along with our regional partners, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Howard County. Um, so uh, with that, I think it's time to wrap up. And again, just explain that over the next couple of months, uh, M.MTA, along with these local jurisdictions, are going to work to select a reduced number of alternatives that we can move forward and then deliver the final report uh, later this fall so that over the next couple of years, we'll be able to perform additional analysis, get down to that, local, to that single locally preferred alternative that we can eventually move through the federal approval process. So we are at the beginning of an exciting but lengthy process. We are excited that you are joining with us and we hope that you appreciate today's presentation. So I think with that, um, we opened it up during the public meeting to an open discussion. Uh, I think in both cases, we had something like 30 to 45 minutes worth of discussion with the project team. If you do have further questions, please do go to the website. That's rtpcorridors.com. You can also email rtp at mta.maryland.gov. And I think that's the end of our presentation. So thank you, everyone.